Thank you, Brian. And thank you, Adele. And my best regards to George, please. Now, the stories I'm going to share with you this afternoon have got two common features and rather unusual features. Firstly, they were not in any sense planned. They just happened. And one having happened led to another and onto another and so on. So it's a series of completely unplanned and yet rather magical stories that have evolved over the last, I guess it's now about 25 years. The second feature of the programs that I'm going to talk about is that they were all done with a budget of zero. So you don't need to be a feature film producer to make films that can be screened on television. You can do them uh, essentially for nothing because of the wonderful equipment that we have available today. When I worked in film years ago, the notion of doing a dissolve from one shot to the next involved a Chinagraph pencil on the rough cut piece of film, sending the thing across to Cinevex to the laboratory to get the dissolve done, to see if it was the right length, paying $50 for the privilege. And now I just get two clips on my computer and slide them over each other and go, mm, that's what I want there. So it's just a magic time to be doing this sort of work. The stories I'm going to talk about started back in uh, 1994. My father, uh, that's Dad there, Gordon Smith, um, was a searchlight operator at Australia's secret air base, Andrew, or Landing Field Trust Group, as it was officially called. And I had the privilege of going with Dad and my wicked stepmother, Ray, um, who actually paid for the trip, um, up to Anjo in 1994 for what was the 50th anniversary of the opening and launching of that air base in 1944. So I had this wonderful opportunity to go up there with Dad, and I think I'll just show you the first introductory clip. This is the Anjo Peninsula, in the rugged and remote wilderness that is the East Kimberley region of Western Australia. It's the location of what was known during World War II as RAAF Base Truscott, Australia's secret air base, a staging point for heavy bombers making sorties out across the Timor Sea to Indonesia and beyond. The war in the Pacific had escalated with the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbour on the 7th of December 1941. Little more than a year later Singapore would fall and just four days after that, at 9.48am on the morning of the 19th of February 1942, the first bombs ever to strike Australian soil were dropped by Japanese aircraft led by Commander Mitsuo Fukida. From that first raid until the 12th of November 1943, Darwin and the surrounding region was attacked in 64 raids involving more than 1,200 Japanese aircraft. Fighters, dive bombers, bombers and heavy bombers. No longer an onlooker, Australia was now an active defender of its soil in the Pacific theatre. And defend we did. By late 1943, under the command of General Douglas MacArthur, Commander-in-Chief, Southwest Pacific Area, the main thrust of air power was to push the Japanese northwards by attacking targets in the region to Australia's north, including Timor, Borneo and Java. But the available airfields, up to 800 kilometres from the northern coast of Australia, severely limited the range of heavy bombers. An airfield right at the northern tip of Western Australia was clearly called for. The existing strip at Drysdale was not suitable for such heavily laden aircraft. The solution was to start from scratch and build a new purpose-built airbase on the Anjo Peninsula. This would afford maximum range for heavy bombers and mine-laying Catalinas and would also provide vital air cover for ships bringing supplies around the coast from Fremantle to Darwin. Not all of the aircraft based at Truscott completed their missions. At a quarter to six on the morning of the 20th of May 1945, just 12 weeks before the end of the war, one of these B-24 Liberators, number A-72-160, loaded to the hilt with depth charges, crashed shortly after takeoff, 350 yards from the northwestern end of the runway. The Liberator's pilot, 26-year-old Flight Lieutenant Frank Sisme, and all 10 of his crew, several less than 20 years of age, died in the explosion. B-24 
Back in Sydney, Frank Sisme's wife was pregnant with their daughter, who would be called Helen. Helen Sisme, now Helen Brown, was sitting opposite me in an historic Australian Air Force Douglas DC-3 Dakota, known affectionately as a Goonie Bird. Together with her husband Bob, Helen had flown from their home in Christchurch, New Zealand, so that she could view for the first time the wreckage of the plane in which the father she never knew perished. Helen and Bob Brown were not alone on this journey. Along with more than 70 surviving veterans and some of their relatives, the Browns had been invited to attend the 50th reunion of the completion of Truscott Air Base. Apart from the Kiwi contingent, the vets had all come from the southern parts of Australia, just as they had when they travelled to Truscott by rail and road during the war. These travellers, most in their 70s, hailed from Western Australia, South Australia, Victoria, Tasmania and New South Wales, flying first to Darwin, then on to Kununurra to meet the DC-3 on the 17th of May 1994. From Kununurra, the Goonie Bird would take them the last 169 nautical miles to Truscott, an hour and a half at a cruising speed of 115 knots. Truscott Base was named after the Melbourne football player and fighter ace Keith Bluey Truscott. Arguably Australia's finest wartime fighter pilot, Bluey Truscott didn't survive the war. On the evening of the 28th of March 1943, along with Flying Officer Ian Loudon, Truscott was escorting a Catalina back to base at Exmouth. Bored with the task at hand, the two pilots made a series of mock attacks on the flying boat, which had been slowly descending over the mirror-like waters of Exmouth Gulf. Great combat pilot though he was, Truscott had always had difficulty judging his height for landing. Over water in the afternoon light, this proved fatal. On his final pass at 5.35pm, he attempted to fly right underneath the Catalina and quite simply misjudged it. Australia lost an ace and gained a legend. One of the veterans was my dad, Gordon Smith. He'd spent five months on Searchlight Station 12 at Truscott. I'd heard tall tales, some possibly even true, about Anjo for as long as I could recall. Whenever Dad and his mates got together, the conversation rapidly turned to searchlights, gen sets, and shark traps. So you can see the range of experiences that were involved in that. I'd like to um, explain to you how those mysterious aircraft shots were generated. There was no uh, aircraft with a camera flying behind Bluey Truscott when he went into the, uh, into the sea. Uh, thanks to the miracle of Microsoft Flight Simulator, I was able to get representative aircraft and fly them myself uh, while capturing the images on my computer, which are at full uh, high definition resolution. And so I flew all those scenes and worked them together to form the story throughout the whole um, documentary. I must say the experience of um, meeting Helen Brown was extraordinary because Helen had only been contacted two weeks before the reunion and uh, the story really did evolve as we were flying towards Truscott and I simply had to film 24 hours a day while we were there for the whole four days. Helen very graciously let me film her first viewing of the wreckage that killed her father and that was one of those moments where I was literally crying and, and barely able to focus for, for the emotion of the moment. Quite incredible. It's also incredibly emotional to have Dad being interviewed on the actual airstrip that I'd heard so much about. It was a, a most remarkable thing to be able to do. Dad died three years after we visited there. He'd been very sick uh, and he died there. But I do have these reflections. Here's a very short section of reflections. Uh, Adele, if I would be able to have the second clip, please. Thank you. <laughs> For my father, as indeed for so many of the veterans, yeah. the trip was a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Oh, it's just an, an unbelievable experience because it, uh, what happened 50 years ago was just a weird happening in boyhood. 
and here it is 50 years later and I'm back in the same spot. It's very hard to believe. It always used to seem like a bad dream when we came home uh, to realise that part of life was behind us and we'd never get back there again. Um, and here we are, we're back. And uh, it just seems as though pages have been opened out of a large book uh, that we thought would be closed forever. It's uh, a very emotional time, actually, for a lot of us. Yeah, it was a very emotional time. Um, and of course, the guys didn't stop talking for the entire four days we were there. There were so many stories to share and uh, taller tales to make even taller. One of the strange things, there are so many strange things that have flowed from that program that I made. Um, one of which was that I gave a copy to my brother-in-law who was down at Summers and Frank couldn't get it to play on his player for some reason or other, goodness knows why. So he took it next door to his uh, neighbour, David Holmes, and David looked at it and he said, An Anjo, has I helped to build that airstrip in 1944? <laughs> <laughs> so immediately I was able to go down and do an interview with David Holmes in his house at Summers. Um, we might just play one little bit of that, please, Adele. This one? That one, yeah, thanks. So tell me about some of the activities that were going on up there. Tell me about the, the aircraft and so on. And, and well, the there weren't, weren't any aircraft when we went there first because there was no strip mm. to put them down on. The, mm. And uh, the helicopters hadn't come into their own, of course, mm. at that stage. And uh, there were no aircraft at all. We built the strip. We mm. built the roads, uh, roads up from the beach. Now, to bring the fuel, we came from the Liberty ship when we arrived. We came to the Liberty ship and they brought us in on barges. And the barges would be about, hold about two normal trucks. Uh, perhaps maybe yeah, about two, two or three normal trucks. And they'd bring us in and we'd have to wait in the last bit because they were frightened of getting stranded with the tide. It was very shallow in parts there. That was all right. Then when they brought the fuel in for the aircraft and the bits of bitumen and the oil and everything, they used to bring the barges in and they'd load the barges very heavily and they, of course they couldn't get them in too far. So they then would drop the gate on the barge, roll the drums off the barge and the, the drums would just float and we'd wade out to overweight and bring these barges uh, bring these drums into the shore mm. and then pick them up with a a, 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 a a digger would pick them up with, with chains on it and put them on trucks and mm. take them off we'd take them off to the dump but uh, yes the, uh, but the crocs never worried us there was too many of us I think and too many drums about <laughs> <laughs> too much disturbance yeah, yeah. too much disturbance. Yeah. But that was how they did it at that stage. What about swimming at that stage? Did you ever go for a swim? Or? Uh, no, no, because some chaps did, I believe, but uh, we, a, a chap persuaded us. We, were, we had a, a very limited diet there for a long, long time. It was bully beef, beetroot and biscuits and some dreadful butter to put on the biscuits, tin butter. There was an American camp over from us and they saw me carting water to our camp one day and one of the chaps said, could you bring us a load of water? And I couldn't believe they, they, were, in, they, they were insufficient supplied. So I, I, I used to just go and fill up with water, uh, pumping it out of a river in, 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 and uh, I'd take them. Take see, and they gave, I took, so I can't remember why, but I only did it two or three times and that, the last time I did it was breakfast time. They said, look, come in and have breakfast. Mm. And they gave me pancakes and I hadn't had a meal like it for <laughs> ages. One of the amazing things that happened um, after this, uh, and after Dad had died, I managed to catch up with George Bell. And there's George at the reunion uh, at the age of 75. Um, that's George down here. Now, George showed me a whole Oh, probably seven photo albums that he collected the, during his time in the war. And um, I said, look, to my son, I said, Timmy, look, we should get, sit George down. And we sat him down at 
a, a warehouse in Collingwood where Denby had a studio set up and we just sat George in a chair with a camera over his head looking down onto the album so we could see which picture he was pointing at and another camera looking at George and George loves to talk or loved to talk <coughs> since passed away but he um, he spoke to us for about um, five and a half hours over two days going through every picture of the album <coughs> with most meticulous detail. Now just by getting those um, stories from George, the photos in his album came to life in ways you could never have guessed. This is one little story uh, called The Girls at Port Douglas, and I'll just let George tell his story here. Can have that one, please? Adele, that's the one? Yeah. I formed a great comradeship with one of the other boys there, and one day we decided we'd try our luck on leave and see if we could get to Port Douglas. Uh, we got a series of rides on army vehicles up a fair distance up the coast. It was about 40 miles or more to go. And um, we got as far as the last truck and couldn't get any further, so we walked along the road, hitchhiked, and along came a beautiful car, big car. It stopped to pick us up. It was driven by an old man, and um, I'd say he'd be in about his 50s or 60s, and uh, in the back was two ladies. And uh, we got in with them and uh, we told them where we were going. They said, well, we're not going that far, but we're going to one of the beautiful beaches further up. Join us, they said, if you like. So we went up with them. We had a beautiful picnic on the beach there. And um, we had a swim and um, they um, took us all the way back that night to our searchlight stations individually. We were both on different stations. Dropped us off and uh, we had a wonderful day. Uh, unfortunately, I've got two photos here, very faded photos, of the two ladies that gave us the hospitality. Uh, three ladies, my mistake, three ladies. Uh, two in one group and um, three in the other. Uh, very faded, unfortunately. On picnics, they'd taken us two and another one over here. Uh, my cobra in one and I in the other. Now, thereafter, every now and then, to our individual two stations would, would arrive these two ladies. And they'd bring great boxes of fruit, tin fruit, Fantastic. all groceries, everything you can think of. This was all additional thing, luxuries to us, which we couldn't get in the army rations. They got us back to our stations and uh, fruit and things used to still come out to the stations and we thought, this is remarkable, what's going on? Anyway, uh, we were in Cairns for 12 months and in the latter last few months, all this hospitality got the better of my cobber and he, he started to inquire from the nearest storekeeper to his detachment site who these ladies were. And it turned out they were the high class prostitutes who only dealt with American officers. <laughs> so consequently, how we used to get all the luxuries. But they're always ladies to us. They never hinted on their background and we always found them good company. And it was, it really was. And uh, I wasn't, and it's strange to say, word spread around, of course, our unit what was going on with us getting all these luxuries, you see. I was hauled up before my commanding lieutenant as to what was going on. I said, it's perfectly innocent. We didn't know anything about it. They wouldn't believe us. They wouldn't believe us. <laughs> <laughs> now, can we just pause on that frame, please? At that interesting. Now, after, <coughs> three months after that set of stories were filmed, George had a series of strokes and was no longer able to speak clearly. The point being clearly that you have to do these things, you have to get them recorded while people are, their memories are intact and their speech is intact and so on. I, I said to my son, I can't believe how, um, not lucky, it wasn't luck, it was just that we got off our bums and did it and we had, had these wonderful records of George. Now George came to me about a year later, because I used to go down and have coffee and a cup of tea with him and his wife down at, um, near Brighton. And George one day came out and he said, well, I think, David, it's time to show you something. And he came out with this great big 
arch file, 150 pages of that, all in capitals. It was his entire wartime experience, day by day, through the whole thing. You could let it play if you like, uh, Adele, please. Let me just finish that one off. And I looked at it and I, he told me some of the stories and um, the, one of them was the girls at Port Douglas. And I just thought, this is just too good to leave in an arch file that will get thrown out down the track. Um, so I went, I went to a company uh, called Smart Docs in Tasmania and had them transcribe the whole book. And I thought, this is such a daunting task. Who's going to possibly be able to do this? But we found a woman in Queensland who did the transcription. And I spoke to her and I said, how are you handling it? I said, I, I, it took me about half a day to do a page. Um, and she said, oh, no, I'm enjoying it. I, every morning I wake up and I think, I wonder where Mr. Bell's going to take me today. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, we found the right person, thank goodness, which was wonderful. Um, now, having got the book transcribed, or his notes transcribed, it then became possible uh, through a company called uh, Lightning Force in uh, Box Hill to have the whole thing converted into a book. And the marvellous thing about this process, there's the book, there's the whole thing set through. I typeset it myself um, with a friend who's a graphic designer. Um, there's George and me sitting with a copy of his book about three months before he died. And uh, that sort of makes you really feel good inside when you see George's big smile. And there he is about three weeks before he dies, holding up the second edition of the book which had got rid of all the errors that I had introduced in the first one. <laughs> now, that was George's story. There's George's book. I obviously had become interested in the Liberator story. I discovered uh, that there was a Liberator being restored at a, a hangar in Werribee, um, one of the last ones uh, anywhere in the world, in fact, because they'd all been uh, stripped down and melted down for the aluminium after the war. Um, this one is at the Werribee station, the Werribee uh, aerodrome now. And I learned also that there were two pilots still alive in Melbourne who had flown Liberators. So if we could play it again, please, Adele. Thank you. This is the hangar at Werribee, where since 1992, Liberator A72176 has been progressively restored. While filming interviews with many of the restoration volunteers, I learned there were two Liberator pilots aged in their 90s still living in Melbourne. I filmed long interviews with Ed Crabtree and John Temby. John told me about some of his flying adventures, then described how he rebuilt the aircraft's instrument panel. We, we, we had a lot of fun because there were a lot of low-level exercises involved in that and quite a you know, at, when we got to target, well these blokes were training, of course they were nav wireless navigators training for mosquitoes and bow fighters. So they needed the low level training and that. <laughs> Bit of fun. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I remember I had two uh, fellows on refresher course. They'd been in a bow fighter squadron actually. And it was just, the squadron was just formed and became operational. Uh, and some thoughtless idiot dropped a big, big bomb on Hiroshima and spoiled all the fun. <laughs> That's a great way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, uh, uh, generally speaking, well, entirely, I think, my time in the Air Force was one great big giggle. You know, it was, there was nothing nasty about it at all, for which I was probably very thankful in the end. And that's my drawing for the, um, for the runway. Oh, the runway. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, that's our hangar there. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know whether you, you saw that display cockpit on the floor. Mm -hmm. Well, I built all that. I, I, from the bits that we already had, I did see a series of draw a set of drawings, and from the drawings we built the new pedestals and, and panel and so forth. These are photographs inside it. The cockpit. It looks as though it came out of Tutankhamun's tomb almost. <laughs> of the uh, pedestal lot I made, there's, there's the old one all wrecked and useless. Well, that's uh, the original instrument panel partly done, ready to go back. Yeah, that's getting close to finished. That's probably the, the biggest single job that I've done.
And it was used in a film, apparently. It was, yeah, a film called Unbroken. It's just been made in Queensland or somewhere. Yes, it was. It was used in the film. I'd love to see the film. <laughs> desperate to show me something that he had under his side, <coughs> a bedside table at the nursing home where he was living at this stage. Uh, he pulled out a, a series of photocopied documents about this thick, um, which were in fact transcripts of his father's diaries from World War I. Uh, Raymond Timby had served in Somme in the Western Front and was a really good writer. He had a terrific turn of phrase and so John had seen this book because I showed that to him and he kind of put the hard wood on me to do the same thing for his father's book, which I did, and there it is. That's the uh, SIG, Diaries of an Australian Signaler During World War I by Raymond P. Tempe. And again, it was done on the cheap through this wonderful company, um, Lightning Force. It only cost $6 per book to have them made, and you can make anywhere from one to as many as you like. You can make a, run of, a print run of 50 books if you want to. Now in the past, you know, only five or six years ago, you had to go to a printer and get a thousand or a publisher to get a, at least a thousand, maybe two thousand copies done, and I could never have afforded to uh, underwrite that. But when you're, do, when you're doing 50 copies at six bucks a pop, um, it's, it's reasonable and it's possible to do it. So that was that picture of um, John sitting there with his uh, lovely smile on his face, which made me very happy indeed. Even happier was his son, Andrew, who's one of Australia's leading um, aerobatic pilots. Um, and uh, Andrew has told me a number of times, he said, I just love the DVD you made of Dad. So I made a full DVD of the long interviews with John. And he said, Dad and I used to just sit and talk flying, you know, for hours, and now he's gone. Um, I can play the DVD and I can still have those, part of those conversations with him, which is, again, just makes the whole thing so worthwhile. Now I want to take you to a whole different world, away from the war, and to a street in North Baldwin called Rookwood Street. I was sitting having coffee with a couple of people from the gym group that I go to after gym one morning, and I was talking about, we were all talking about how lucky we'd be as kids growing up in this area, um, jumping on our billy carts and push bikes after school and just playing until the sun went down. And weren't we lucky to have had it that way? And I said, we used to get in the billy cart down Rookwood Street and it was a steep hill with a little kick up at the end so that your billy cart would stop before it ran into um, Baldwin Road and you got run over. <laughs> and Kim at the table looked at me and said, Rookwood Street, what number were you in Rookwood Street? I said, well, we're, uh, it was, um, we were in 17 Rookwood Street. And he said, well, I've got friends who lived in 15 Rookwood Street for 30 years. And I went, I oh, will actually... <laughs> Mum and Dad built 15 Rookwood Street, that was their very first house, and I was born there. Um, and then later on, after a couple of other moves, they moved back and built a house in um, 17 Rookwood Street next door. And so Kim said, well, who were the people living there in 15 when you were in 17? I said, well, it was the Cracknell family. And the other woman at the table, Sue, said, well, that's incredible, because my maiden name was Cracknell. Um, and so you go, oh, <laughs> six degrees of separation. It's quite amazing how these things work. Having done all these things for um, ageing war veterans and hearing their wonderful stories and bringing them to life in it as, as best I could, I was determined to capture some of our own family history and I had uh, scanned a whole huge number of um, photographs. My um, life began with cameras, in fact with this camera. Um, my uncle Laurie gave me this camera because he worked at Kodak and my auntie Olvi worked at Kodak and I, was, I had this in my hand from the age of about five or six. Um, and the whole family were the same, there were cameras everywhere. So we uh, have a very, very large collection of photographs, which is great. Except 
I don't know most of the people in the photographs. I have no idea who these people are. And some of the older people are in the weirdest clothing and women in very strange hats. And we go, who on earth was she and why was the photograph taken? So I've got an aunt and an uncle. Auntie Joyce is 90, Uncle Bruce is uh, 84. And they've both got fantastic memories. Their memories are completely intact. They, in fact, love the detail of all the family history. And I thought, look, the thing to do is to sit them down in front of my computer with a camera on their faces so I can see their expressions and so on, and um, a camera behind them over their shoulder so I can see which picture they're talking about. And then I can bring that picture up full frame on the computer if I want to see the picture in detail. And I'll gain a number of things out of this. I'll get some funny stories being told by these two characters of my relatives. And I'll also learn a lot of the, um, the detail of who the people in the photographs are in a fairly pleasant way to do it. So this is what has happened. Let's have a look now, please, Adele. And th these are the ones that I found from Dad's collection, 15 Rookwood Street. Oh, yes. So there's 15. Yeah. Well, that was nice. I had it... two photos of this, and I've now got all these. Lovely. They've That's just not even finished. No, it? well, it's been there built. it is being built. Yeah. Look at all that thing. Yeah, there's more to show that. Well, the way out in the bush. Yeah. Oh, That's and it was a lovely house. Yeah. Still there and too. It's my porch. That's you. Yep. Yeah. Oh, that, that's at Nicholson Street. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, there's a lovely one. That's, I've got that one too. Have you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's lovely, that one. And there's Gordon's. That's his brickwork. The yeah, right. His work that he was very proud I'm of. I'm sure. He did all that himself. He was very proud yeah, of that. Yeah. And that's... See that pram? Take it back a minute. See that pram? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was one of those London Navy cages all beautifully sprung. Oh, right. Yeah. And I used... <laughs> I used to <laughs> take you in it, mm. lying down, and go for a burn down through <laughs> the paddocks at the back to test out the suspension. Fair enough, why not? <laughs> and you yeah. were lying there. Yeah, yeah having and a ball. Whoa, throwing it. Oh. <laughs> Edna didn't know, I don't know. No, right, she wouldn't have enjoyed that. No. No. <laughs> Precious baby. I mean. Oh yeah, then there's, what's her name's hand? Now, this is the view from Rookwood Street in 1952. Uh, and it, yeah, it blows your mind, it is just, they're the paddocks we used to ride our bikes around. Right. It's so much fun. And that's the local horse riding school going for a ride across the paddock. Um, I know that because on the back of this picture, my mum had annotated it and said, note, note the riding school riding across the paddock in the distance. And it's one of the things that's important if you're doing these uh, projects, if you have photographs that have got annotations on the back, it's really important to digitise it next to the actual photograph so they stay together and you don't lose the connection between the uh, valuable information and the That was Macaul's, wasn't it? Macaul's? Yes. Macaul's okay. right, you see. That was, yeah. you're right. Yes, yes. Um, okay, some more please, Adele. Sorry to keep... Yes. <laughs> Wallace's? Yeah, yeah. yeah. that yeah. was about the second. Look, look you couldn't believe yeah, it. That's the rock <laughs> riding across the back. And, there. Yeah, and yeah. that's your school up there yeah. somewhere, or yeah. your future school. Yes, yes. So that's, see, they're classic ones oh, to yeah. have for, I don't mean just for the family, for the whole for the district. Council, yeah, the schools council. and all sorts of mm. things, yeah. Mm. That's the view from, from the, the terrace. terrace, taken January 1948. Yeah, no riding school going out. There they are. Yeah. That's just classic. That's it, is writing. Yeah. Oh, now there's a family group. Now, who are they? Now, this is, a, they, uh, to find these was just a joy. Because I didn't know they existed. No. I didn't know they Yes, they are. You do. There's, that's Edda. Edda. Mum. I can't see it. Edda, Mum. Sorry it's so small. Auntie Sis. She must have been on holidays. Yeah. And Elvie. That's <coughs> Elvie with the long black hair. Mm. Yes. Me. Yeah. And Dad. <coughs> and Dad, yeah. No, I can't see that. Oh, now that's some... Um, it says the other girl is a neighbour. Pat Duncan. It's Pat Duncan, yeah. Yes, I wrote right. that in. Remember yeah. Duncan. Yeah. With baby Neil. Now, here's a story. This is me and mum and Pat Duncan mm -hmm. and her baby was Neil Duncan. Now, about five years ago, I was filming interviews at Strathcona uh, for a, a bloke, or filming for a woman called Nadia uh, Morrissey, and her husband was Mark Duncan. And I asked Mark, I said, um, he was the maths teacher at Strathcona, and I said, um, hey, Mark, Duncan, are you related to Neil Duncan? And he got a strange look on his face and said, um, 
I've got to go right back in a minute, sorry, and he sort of awkwardly left. He came back with the senior maths teacher at Strathcona, who was Neil Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> My old mate from school. <laughs> oh dear, it, 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 it's uncanny how these things happen. Um, the connections are quite astonishing to me. The joy of all this is, as I said earlier, with computer technology, you can do all sorts of things. Um, working with film was ridiculously expensive. Um, even for slide films and things, you had to be very careful how many photos you took because they cost a lot of money, as we all know. These days, with digital cameras like this little GoPro, sorry, GoPro, it's a Sony action cam, um, the possibilities are remarkable. They're free, basically. Once you've bought the camera, all you have to do is charge the batteries and you can take as many pictures as you like and then sort them through. Um, the simplest thing of all, of course, is to use your mobile phone. And the trick of doing these sort of projects is to try and get a steady image. And the simplest way to do it with a mobile phone is to put it in a little holder like this, which you can get anywhere, get them at JV Hi-Fi or whatever for a few dollars. And you can just stand it up there and choose a shot that includes the computer screen and the person who's being interviewed, not too far away so you get good sound. And you'll get, uh, as long as you want to record, you can just record the interview for hours if you need to. It's an amazing time. When I filmed underwater films years ago, using 16mm film. I had a great big Bolex 16mm camera that cost a fortune. It was in a gigantic Perspex housing that cost a fortune. You got three minutes of film on the roll of film, so every three minutes you had to come back to the surface, wash the thing down with fresh water, take out the camera, take out the film in a black bag, put a new film in, put it all back together, jump in the water again and get the next three minutes worth of film. This thing will run for four hours and it's ultra high definition, 4K resolution, it does sound as well, and the kids today do not know how lucky they are. <laughs> I think I might stop at this point, uh, Bryony, and ask if there are more questions. Um, Any in questions? Those, day, these days, they, when they're building housing in the States, mm -hmm. you know, they build the roads and the gutters, and everything first. In mm. my day at Park Orchards, when there were orchards there in Don Vale, they just used to put a, a house on a dirt track. Mm. <coughs> this is true, and it was a dirt track in Rookwood Street when we were building there. It was four, four in fact, I got into trouble yeah. for going out one day as a little tank of this size and being invited into the bulldozer by the bulldozer driver and popping up into the bulldozer through all this mud. I came back, I was mud from here to here and got thoroughly told off for taking a terrible risk. <laughs> I loved it, it was great. I got to pull the cable that released the mud, you know. It was great fun. But yes, that was a different, sorry, no. Oh no, it's, it's kind of a technical question. Mm. When you're doing um, all of these interviews yes. uh, and you want to edit them, there's an issue in that people are keep on talking and they're keeping on talking and, and you actually want to come up there but then you yes. know, it's, it's all inappropriate. I know, and, so I just, well. and I just wondered uh, if you've got any hints about that yeah. or how, how you do your editing. I, I do have a couple of hints. Um, it's, I, I try and teach people this um, based on work I learned myself, learning to do radio um, editing um, and, and also video editing. It's incredibly important not to make a noise after you've asked your question. You ask the question, you say, how old was John when he went to school? And you leave a gap. And you make sure that you've primed the person to say, just leave a gap after I've asked the question. And that gives you a cutting point. And it's also important to uh, try and get people to speak in complete sentences if they can, rather than just saying, yes, that's good. You say, the reason it was interesting was because of such and such. So you get them to just instruct them to, to make a complete sentence and also try and get people, some people just can't do it, some people can't stop talking. They have to keep going, they go from one point to the next point and then the further point comes after that and because of that they think of something else and it's really, really hard to find something. <laughs> so try and ask people to do that, ask them to think in terms of short sentences a little bit. George was okay, he, George just talk really naturally. Um, it was wonderful. I mean, we managed to get that footage of him before he had his stroke. Um, so yes, look, some people can do it easily, others can't. But you can help by giving some instructions. And yeah. Do you use specific software for editing? Uh, yeah, I do. I do all my editing in a program called um, Vegas Pro, um, which does, it's basically started out as an audio editing system and it's 
fantastic. And it's really, it's the fastest way. I, I write uh, reviews for um, Australian video camera magazine. So I get to see lots of different software. And I know everyone uses Premiere, and I know everyone likes Adobe, but I don't believe in ransomware. Um, and so Vegas Pro uh, is the fastest way to get from an idea to a finished product. It's, and there's a cheaper version called the Vegas Studio, I think, which is only about $120, something like that. Um, and it's just, it's a really powerful cut down version. It's not that cut down. So that's, that's you know, I've been using it for 20 years and it's fantastic. Is that an annual fee or is it a, a once-off? It's a once-off. That's why I don't like Adobe because they make you pay every year. And as soon as you can't afford to pay it, when you get to this sort of age and you think about retiring, suddenly none of your programs work anymore if you can't pay the subscription. So I despise it. But that's just a personal beef. <laughs> yes? While, while it is rewarding for you or for somebody uh, working in a similar vein to yourself uh, to discover the past, uh, to discover significant associations, people with remarkable memories of significant events. Eventually, um, I mean, some of what uh, you produced is possibly of archival quality and may go to the National Museum or somewhere else. Yes. However, most of what you record is really basically for your own benefit. Now, I've been there, I've done that, and I finished up with stories and photographs and uh, associations and at the end I moved house. What am I going to do with all that? Uh -huh. I offered it to the local public library, I offered it to the state library. Nobody wanted to have anything to do with it. What in the final analysis do you think is the final destination of what you're doing David? Uh, well, that program each of us, sorry, in return to Anjo is on the web. It's there forever. So you can actually get these things in places where people will see it um, for no cost at all. So and it stays there for good. Yeah. yeah. And it's a full high definition version. YouTube is so good these days that you can get a really high quality sound and high quality picture. And I've got most of my programs that I've made are up on the web now. Um, that's one way. I, I did give that to the um, War Memorial. It's, they actually uh, accessioned that. Uh, and these two books, both accessioned at the War Memorial because I thought they were important enough to, um, to be there. This is the, George's book is really just as tales of an ordinary bloke soldier who didn't actually see combat. But that's a really important thing to have told because mostly we get books about heroes who did see combat or sent other people into combat. Um, this is the other side of the coin. The guy who he talks about going trop up in the heat, wandering off from the camp and, not, and getting lost, and the guy could say, "Oh, George has gone trop again," you know, because of the appalling humidity and, and climate uh, and conditions they had. So they had one cup of water a day. These guys <coughs> on, the, on their um, light searchlight station. I don't know how they did it, but when we were there, I was just drinking the whole time because it was so unpleasant and humid. Um, so I don't know how they actually physically did it, but George talks about that in his book. And of course this one then goes back to the First World War and um, it's a different kind of book altogether because this guy sure did see combat. He was, his wife was a nurse and she was plucking shrapnel out of his body for, until he died. Um, you know, literally. Uh, so so they're, they're published very cheaply, very affordably. That's a great way to put them together. Um, and of course I don't know, bring along to places like this and you all buy them from me and I go, wow, I made some money out of this thing. Isn't this great? <laughs> yes. Uh, so that uh, plane, the Liberator, yes. um, has that been restored yet? Oh, it's almost finished. Yes. Um, How come there was a... Bill has been down there and worked on it, so um, you can ask him more detail if you like. But um, um, it, How come there was anything left with all those bombs on board? Oh, that's not the one from Anja. No, it's, it's another one altogether. It was, in fact, story very briefly, it was found in a, on a farmer's backyard in Gippsland. The guy had tried to make a hen house out of it, a fuselage, and um, it sort of just sat there and got rotten. So virtually all the metal plates, all the aluminium plates, were <coughs> removed, cleaned, replaced, re-riveted. Um, an enormous amount of work. You saw the photos of it inside, so it's gleaming now. Uh, I went down 
oh, gee, it must be more than two years ago now, and they did an engine startup. They start the engines from time to time, and that was a, something to see. You've never seen anything like the exhaust coming out of this huge exhaust pipe and this massive engine. And the, the plan is they haven't, they couldn't afford to restore the Liberator to airworthiness because that's a very expensive exercise, just for insurance and all sorts of other things. So they're restoring it to the point where they can start all four engines and taxi it around the runway. And that'll be a great event when that actually happens. I can't wait to see that. Where, where is it? Where is it's at Werribee, just it's on the far side of Werribee from Melbourne. And there's a big hanger and a great big sign outside. So you can't miss it. Just Google Liberator Werribee and you'll find it. Yeah. It's amazing. The work they've put into it is just astonishing. John's cockpit reconstruction, which he was so proud of, and being in the feature film, is just great. Uh, it's open on a Thursday, uh, Sunday, for public inspection and what he wants to call in. And if you're going down that way, it's usually worth looking at the rose garden by the way we mentioned we do it at the right time of the year. But uh, the, it, it's on the south side of the Werribee sort of river and uh, uh, it's uh, quite easy to get at and plenty of parking there. Uh, but um, they've got a shop there where you can buy various souvenirs, things related to the ranges. It's uh, a very good value to just go in and have a look and take the kids there. It's a thing to do. Uh, they've got a, uh, uh, they've got that uh, uh, pilot's uh, uh, <coughs> uh, set up uh, where kids can sit down and uh, pretend they're flying a liberator. Uh, all you've got is the instrument panel in front of you, uh, uh, the uh, control form and all that uh, uh, it's worthwhile. And they did have a, uh, a gun turret which uh, you can get into and uh, uh, go around with the belly turret at the moment quickly. Uh, I don't know if it's working at the moment. I was down there, but so they're in the day reunion this year. I go down every year. Is there a custom library visiting? Hmm? Is there a custom library visiting? Is there a cost? Yeah, is there. Is there oh, I think it's about $2. $2, I think. Yeah. I think it's cheaper. Kids might even get it. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, just to answer your question again a bit further. Um, the thing I've been doing for a number of um, friends and um, uh, just colleagues, people who have contacted me through this little card that I leave around in coffee shops and stuff, which says 35mm slide and negative scanning, print slides, negatives. Um, and I've got a really powerful Nikon full scan scanner which scans at 4,000 dots per inch, which is extraordinary. It does a great job, cleans up the pictures. Um, and so that's what I'm doing for a woman called Lynn Selwood. Um, who's a biologist, she's got uh, about 40 rolls of black and white negative films of marsupial embryos developing, this is her life's work, and she has to get rid of these physical things because she hasn't got room in her house now, her husband's died and she's moving to a smaller place, and so my task right at the moment is scanning all these negs. So I've got them, the scanner there, I just pop a strip, <coughs> a strip of six pictures into the scanner and then do something else and it takes them in, scans them, saves them, pops it back out again. And so over a period of probably about three months, I think, to do seven and a half thousand slides. And she's got a budget from her research budget, so I actually get paid for it, which is even nicer. Because <laughs> my wife would tell you she's not going to let me ever do another freebie project. <laughs> that is absolutely not on anymore. <laughs> Any other? Yes. Just a quick question. Um, uh, interviewing people and using their pictorial or archival material uh, involves that magic word or that ugly word of copyright. Yes. Now, how do you deal with that? Do you get uh, people you interview or you have dealings with to sort of sign off yes. uh, their entitlement? Yes, I have a form, various forms for video interviews or for other, other work, and especially for use of pictures. And it just says, I agree to be, to be a subject of this interview, and I agree that the final project will be um, available on the internet and in publications. And it's basically in the, no limitations. If they're happy with that, and they sign it. And I do keep those forms because it's a, a legal way of getting around any hassles down the track. Some people don't really seem to care and don't mind, but it's always worth asking and being sure. Because copyright is an issue these days, obviously. Now, as for the copyright in these pictures, um, 
I've ignored it, basically. There's a lot of pictures in there. Uh, George and my father took most of the ones in this book. Uh, Dad, they, they sneaked little cameras into, the, uh, into their kit. Uh, Dad told me how he used to have a trench coat on when he came back home coming south with all his films. He would just palm the camera from one hand to the other when the MPs came by and palm it back again. So they, they just didn't get it. And he brought all his photos back. But that was the way things operated in the army. 